Good morning and welcome to Fairlawn Avenue United Church on this Sunday in March, this second Sunday in the season of Lent, as our journey takes us into places of vulnerability and of courage that feel uncannily familiar as we look around us at the world today. As we've been reminded in the media, perhaps more than we really wanted, in fact, it was two years ago this week that the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. And so on Sunday, March 15th, 2020, I found myself sitting on the chancel steps in the sanctuary recording the worship service on an iPhone. That recording is now lost, which is probably for the best. <laughs> this week, Joanne dug up the worship bulletin for that Sunday and reading it is like a time machine, a moment frozen in time. I was reminded of just how jarring, how shocking and sudden that first lockdown was. It brought back to me how dazed and disoriented we felt. At that point, we thought the shutdown would last three weeks, an extended March break. We had so much to learn. And the losses of so many kinds have been painful, and the effects have been lingering. And yet when I asked some fair lawners this week about this bleak anniversary, what came back in, in all honesty were examples of resourcefulness, learning, adaptation, and Gratitude for the things that have been made possible by people's energy and determination and faith throughout these two years. I am aware that an Angus Reid poll this week pointed out that the pandemic has left Canadians in a sour mood, with a majority now saying that the ordeal has significantly disrupted their lives pulled Canadians further apart, brought out the worst in people, and weakened their compassion, which left some of us remembering the sets of kind this the acts of kindness and solidarity early on, banging pots and pans and singing from apartment balconies, the handmade hearts in front windows, and we were left wondering what happened. But as I peer into the future, along with all of you, I am able to be realistic about the stark challenges that await from war in Europe to climate crisis to economic fragility and political dissension, while also, also being doggedly confident that being rooted in the values, the faith, the love that bring us together at Fairlawn, we will, step by step, emerge, in many ways, renewed. I've been hearing people in recent days, too, mentioning the first snowdrops and hints of tulips poking up in the sheltered, sunny corners of their yards next to the house, perhaps. Welcome, early signs of spring after the long, cold winter. It's great, and we know that every year, as it reemerges from under snow and ice, the same garden grows differently. For a few years running, as we gradually got ready to sell our house, Elaine and I took pictures of the glorious flowering front yard at our house, mostly perennials. And yet, year by year, the same garden looked different. Mostly the same flowers, but emerging each spring looking different. Not better, not worse, but changed. We're getting ready as Fairlawn to burst forth once again with new life. We know the world has changed. We know that we are different people now. But we will bloom again and bear fruit, 
and learn to appreciate how things look now, anew, after our long winter. It's really good to gather, and I'm glad you're here. Our digital, our digital, our director of music, uh, digitally as well, Eleanor Daly has curated a selection of music, especially for us and especially for today, as she does week by week. The music bulletin comes alongside this service, digitally, with music that feeds the spirit and reminds us why music is such an important part of how we worship at Fairlawn. Scroll down below this video for the link. Our worship service is not complete until that's a part of it as well. And now join me in words of prayer as we ease into worship this day. Light within all light, spirit within our souls, at the breaking of dawn, at the coming of day, we wait and watch for the opportunities, the discoveries, the joys this new day brings. Love within the human heart, presence beckoning to us from tree and sky, rock and water, the thawing earth warming seeds of new life. May we meet one another with courage in this day and with hope knowing that being together changes who we are. We come opening ourselves to the possibilities in this moment. We come not knowing what is going to happen next. We come opening our senses to the newness all around us. We come not knowing where following Jesus will lead us. We come opening our hearts to your presence, trusting your promise to be with us, always and everywhere and right here, right now. Amen. Our reader today, Don Urquhart, brings us words of prophetic resolve and prophetic lament words that come to us afresh this day as we listen to the story they tell. While the brief words of warning and prophetic lament we read today in Luke are spoken while Jesus continues his ministry in Galilee, the story has begun its long turn towards Jerusalem and all that the day that the city means as Jesus goes about his daily work of healing and deliverance. He is also keenly aware of his destination, Jerusalem, the historic seat of Jewish power where both kings and priests have their home. But prophetic ministry in the face of power is a dangerous activity. And this awareness is put into words by some Pharisees who are worried for Jesus. Although we are accustomed to viewing the Pharisees as Jesus' adversaries, the relationship was in fact more nuanced. So we can take their concern at face value. Jesus balances the reality of Herod's threat to kill him against his clear sense of purpose that outweighs the risk. Today and tomorrow, Jesus will continue his daily work, and he will complete that work on the third day, a foreshadowing of Jesus' resurrection, but also an expression of completeness, of fulfillment. Ironically, perhaps, Alongside the words of threat and risk, Jesus speaks words of protection and shelter to the people. Like a mother hen's poignant attempt to protect her brood with extended wings. These few verses express Jesus' prophetic resolve together with his equally prophetic lament. The image we are left with from Jesus' words is both fierce and vulnerable. Our reading today is Luke 
chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. At that time, some Pharisees approached Jesus and said, go, get away from here because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus said to them, go, tell that fox, look, I'm throwing, I'm throwing out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will complete my work. However, it's necessary for me to travel today, tomorrow, and the next day, because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you. How often I have wanted to gather your people just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you didn't want that. Look, your house is abandoned. I tell you, you won't see me until the time comes when you say blessings on the one who comes in the Lord's name. In this reading, we hear God's word. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Jesus is still in Galilee. He's on his way to Jerusalem, but still far from that city's plots and intrigues. Yet already we can feel the tension for Jesus and for those around him. His friends feel it, and so do those who aren't even sure what they think about him, but who nevertheless fear for him. Jesus knew himself. He had an uncanny degree of self-awareness, it seems, and he was committed to living into and living out what his deep sense of calling, of purpose in life had led him to do and to be, the way he would walk in the world. He knew who he was and he knew where a message like his would lead. There's no way you can utter the words that Jesus said in Nazareth about good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and letting the oppressed go free and expect a happy ending. And Jesus reaffirms this purpose when he insists that despite the risk, despite the tension in the air, he will continue what he'd set out to do. He had no intention of giving up or giving in. Threats will not delay or derail or deter his resolve. It's not that Jesus was in lockstep with destiny in some way. His life's path was not foreordained so that he walked through it like a robot. He was purposeful, resolute in his grasp of a love that had led him to expect more from God, more hope, more abundant living, more joy, more love. Jesus knew that he was on the way and that this mattered, despite the obvious risk. In fact, he sensed that God's more lay on the other side of that risk, that his path went through it. For Herod, Jesus was an enigma and a threat. After Herod had John the Baptist beheaded, Jesus rose up before him like a specter, the ghost of John. For Jesus, on the other hand, Herod is a fox, sly, cunning, and lethal. But despite issuing predictable threats, he was not someone Jesus would be deterred by. In his book on the human search for meaning that was born of the Nazi concentration camps, Viktor Frankl quotes Friedrich Nietzsche, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Jesus' sense of purpose enabled him to face his fear, trusting that his life had meaning more enduring than Herod's hatred. 
the God that inspires, fills, and calls Jesus is filled with empathy for humanity, feeling our pain as well as our joy, and willing to suffer for our personal and social healing. This is why, for us today, facing the desperate and apparently unsolvable crises of the world, we do not give up heart. We are not afraid. We work together to respond with hope and courage, to join the struggle, knowing that we are part of God's story and that by our lives we can help heal the world. So not distracted by Herod's threats, and still some distance away in Galilee, Jesus' attention is already on Jerusalem and on all that that city represents symbolically. But he also looks with compassion on its people, pulled back and forth and tragically deluded by political and religious powers alike. The words of lament that Jesus speaks in Luke are tinged with a great sadness. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Among other things, in these words of lament, by describing himself and God as a mother hen, Jesus gives us permission, if we still need it, to imagine God through a wide range of images and genders and beyond any of them on, our, on their own. The Bible is, in fact, brimming with images for God, both male and female and also gender fluid. At different times, God is described as a protective mother eagle, a fierce mother bear, a mother giving birth, a mother breastfeeding her child, God as mum of a healthy, happy toddler, God as skilled midwife. When we limit ourselves in the ways that we imagine God, we stunt our spirituality. But there's more to this, because if female power, acumen, or success were the characteristics that Jesus wanted to emphasize, he could have used any number of biblical images to make his point. I, I mentioned the prophet's picture of God as an enraged mother bear. Or there's the Lion of Judah, often portrayed as a lioness, but instead Jesus evokes a mother hen, a mother hen whose chicks don't even want her. Though she stands with wings wide open, offering belonging and shelter, her children refuse to come. A mother struggling with failure and futility who plants herself in the center of danger and offers refuge there, where feathers fly and blood is spilled. Those who've seen mother hens protect their chicks when a predator approaches, describe the way they swell with indignation, fear, and courage, the way they stand their ground, the way they prepare to die if they have to, their children tucked close, shielded. For Jesus, the image is awash with lament, with a helpless yearning. How often have I desired to gather you? It is a lament for all that could have been in this chaotic, clueless world when we can't do what we most desire to do, can't give what we deeply long to give. If you have loved someone you could not protect, then you understand the depth of Jesus' lament. All you can do is open your arms. You cannot make anyone walk into them. It's the most vulnerable of postures. But when you love, then this is how you stand in courage and lament. 
There's another kind of courage that we see here, not the kind that's captured in a moment of bravery, but the kind that emerges in the face of a looming challenge or confrontation by not turning away, but moving steadily to meet it head on. This is the kind of courage that Jesus displays when the Pharisees warn him. He will keep on his path. He will see his work called, uh, taken through to its conclusion. We can admire the courage that Jesus displays in continuing on his way on to Jerusalem. But what strikes me is the vulnerability within that courage to anticipate confrontation and suffering and not look away is to be vulnerable. And it's important to notice because as a culture, we don't tend to equate vulnerability with courage and strength, with care, love, and concern, perhaps, but not often with courage and strength. We recognize the need to be vulnerable with those we care about most deeply, but don't often see vulnerability as part of living courageously. And yet Jesus' vulnerability is essential to his courage. The vulnerability that's found at the heart of spirituality and faith allows us to discover the peculiar strength of being open to the needs, the wounds, and the volatility of those around us. So Jesus presses on to Jerusalem not to prove himself fearless or a hero, not to be a sacrifice for sin to a judgmental God or even to combat death and the devil. Jesus continues to Jerusalem and all that awaits him there out of profound love, a mother's fierce love that will stop at nothing for her children. As many of us have come to appreciate, few have revealed more about vulnerability than Brene Brown. Through her podcasts and books, this social researcher and storyteller has invited us to recognize that while vulnerability inevitably opens us up to feeling things we might want to avoid, it also spurs us on to be more authentically human, more caring, compassionate, and courageous than we could otherwise be. Brene Brown reminds us that courage comes from the Latin word for heart, and she defines courage as living from the heart. A willingness to embrace our vulnerability in order to be our authentic authentic selves. For those of us who seek to be followers of Jesus, courage can be in the kind of wholehearted living that comes from believing that we are not alone and that loved by God as fiercely as we are, we are enough. And not only that, but those around us are also God's beloved, and deserve our love, empathy, and respect. So, so Jesus, not merely acting courageously, but embracing who he was called to be for the sake of those he loves, invites us to be who we are called to be, courageously and with vulnerability, for the sake of those around us. Some have seen such qualities of courage and vulnerability in Volodymyr Zelensky, the Jewish grandson of a Holocaust survivor and now the unlikely and defiant president of Ukraine. What would our community of faith, Fairlawn, look like if we decided together to live wholeheartedly 
making room to name and to live into our vulnerabilities in the confidence that God is with us, that we are not alone, and that God's Spirit goes with us together, not simply to endure the challenges before us, but to flourish as we discover that God meets us most reliably in our vulnerability. If God is again and again most with us there in vulnerability, then it is in those places and through those experiences, whether COVID-19, the housing crisis, the war in Ukraine, whatever they are, in those places that we find a way to discover more fully who we have been called to be and find ways to connect more deeply with those around us in love. To be vulnerable is courageous. And to experience the vulnerability of God in the manger and on the cross is an empowering and transforming moment of spiritual maturity and awareness and hope. Even or especially in such a time as this. I'll end with this. The U.S. author, poet, and theologian, Laura Kelly Fanucci, picks up on this spirit of vulnerability and courage in her poem about the ways COVID-19 might shape how we now will live. When this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, full shelves at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, we were called to be, we hoped to be. And may we stay that way, better for each other because of the worst. Amen. Our music today is an arrangement by Eleanor Daly of Jerusalem, Thou That Killest the Prophets, from Felix Mendelssohn's Oratorio, St. Paul. The text is based on a verse from this morning's scripture reading, and it's sung by three of Fairlawn Avenue Senior Choir's male section leads. Children, and 
taken a moment to click open this week's greetings newsletter, which highlights our Fairlawn Forward process of discernment leading to decision-making regarding Fairlawn's future directions. The first in a series of congregational conversations takes place today during coffee chat beginning at 11.15 a.m. It will provide a brief overview of our context as we look to the future with time for discussion. You will have received this week a package of background information to read in preparation. So have your voice heard about how Fairlawn will emerge from COVID, decide on a clear direction for future ministry, and in due course, call a new minister. Join the discussion with the transition team and the Fairlawn community at 11.15 a.m. this morning. And now, with hearts filled with many thoughts and prayers, let us bring our hearts together in prayer. Holy and loving one on this almost not quite spring day, we gather with so many thoughts, deep concerns and worry, fragile hopes, all vying for words within us and for room in our hearts. As we mark two years of enduring the losses, the limitations, the costs of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are aware of grief for the things, the people we have lost, the things that matter that we've gone without, and all that we have missed keenly. Being with friends and family in everyday ways and for important milestones, hugs and the closeness of human touch, simple life-giving things that we took for granted that were replaced by anxiety and worry and risk assessments. We also acknowledge and are grateful for all that we've learned about ourselves and our world through this, that less is more, and that when we are selective and purposeful in how we live, we can have time for what really matters. We've learned that community and spirituality can exist in virtual spaces, and that the church is alive and can adapt creatively and innovatively, that with a little effort, we, along with the whole world, can figure out a new way to do things. We've also learned that relentless stress can bring out the worst in us if we allow it to happen. And that the suffering created by this global turmoil is colossal and will last long beyond the reach of vaccines. We've learned that some things are beyond anyone's control and that we need to be a part of a caring community to thrive. So now we pray as we move through this lingering stretch of emerging from pandemic that your vulnerable and courageous love will show us pathways to be our best selves, to be all that you have created us to be. Creating one, we've entered an era once more of destruction. As bombs fall on the innocent, as lives are uprooted and chaos is sown on the earth in Ukraine. In our lives, in our life together as nations and states. Give us the radical courage to be as we are capable to be as we are capable of being. Creative and creating, loving and growing, praying and working for peace. Hear the cries of your people. Grant them courage, grant them hope, grant them peace. In the silence of our hearts, we form the prayers that come without words. O 
open our hearts to hear good news of peace today. Open our eyes to see glimpses of your grace in enemy and friend. Open our lips to sing with joy. Open our lives to bear fruit for your vision of life on earth as it is in heaven. We pray as followers of Jesus. Amen. Once again, if you have read your greetings newsletter this week, you, have, you will have also seen an important update from the Property Council and the Reentry Task Group, indicating that in-person worship services in the sanctuary will likely begin on April 3rd. The Property Council has thoroughly reviewed the roof leak, leak in the sanctuary and determined that barring a severe snowstorm, we can reopen for services on the first Sunday in April, the 3rd, two weeks earlier than we had previously thought. In the unlikely event that weather forces a cancellation, an email will be sent out, and do stay tuned for more information about procedures and protocols that we will follow in the re-entry process to ensure safety. And now words of blessing as we go from this time together, words that come from the U.S. theologian Edwina Gately and from her book, There Was No Path, So I Trod One. Soften us, gentle God, soften us. Let the fire of your love thaw the frost within us. Let the light of your justice sear away our blindness. Let the grace of your compassion heal our hardened spirits. O living God, soften us. That flowing with your grace, we be impelled to face the world in bold compassion. That driven to justice, we may dare to cry aloud for the little ones. The beaten, the imprisoned, and the hungry. O living God, soften us, sweep us forward in a mighty wave of mercy to heal our hurting world. Go in peace. Amen.